In the last few videos we looked at predicting the shapes of molecules. The next step is to have a look at what are called molecular dipoles. When you understand the idea of molecular dipoles you'll be able to see how and why the shape and type of atoms in a molecule directly influence the properties of the substance. Why for instance water has a massively higher boiling point than methane or why oil and water don't mix. Before we look at molecular dipoles however we have to take a step back and look at individual bonds. Back in Unit 1 you were introduced to a number of periodic trends, one of which was electronegativity. This was defined as the tendency of an atom in a bond to draw electron density towards itself. Note that the atom has to form a bond for the concept of electronegativity to have any meaning. and This is why some atoms on the periodic table don't have an electronegativity value. Either they don't form bonds, like the noble gases here, or they're so short-lived that no one has ever been able to do the right measurements, like the radioactive elements here. So fluorine is the element that has the highest electronegativity, and uh, down the bottom left, cesium and francium are the elements with the lowest electronegativity. And the trend in general is that the electronegativity increases as you go across a period and decreases as you go down a group. You may also remember that when two atoms get together, it's their electronegativities that influence what kind of bond they'll form. For instance, if a pair of atoms with widely differing electronegativities meet, they'll form an ionic bond. The atom of low electronegativity, which will be the metal, will donate one or more of its valence electrons to an atom of high electronegativity, which will be the nonmetal, and the resulting ions attract to form an ionic bond. However, if both atoms have relatively high electronegativity, it's not energetically favourable for either of them to give up an electron to get a full outer shell. So instead, they share electrons and they complete their outer shells in that way. And this is called the covalent bond. OK, so let's consider a simple covalent bond between two identical atoms, as happens with diatomic elements like bromine, oxygen, hydrogen and so on. Remember Brinkelhoff. In a bond like this, since the atoms are identical, they have the same electronegativity. And this means that they both exert an equal pull on the electron density, so it's evenly shared between them. This picture from the Models 360 database illustrates this by showing a whole fluorine molecule coloured green, which indicates that there is even electron density around the molecule. However, if a covalent bond forms between two different atoms, then the atom with the higher electronegativity will exert a greater pull on the electron density and it will not be evenly shared. This is a picture of hydrogen fluoride. The red indicates high electron density and the blue indicates low. And you can see that the very electronegative fluorine atom, the larger one on the left, has taken the lion's share of the electron density. When you get uneven electron density in a bond, the bond is called polar. Now if we're going to talk about polar bonds, I need to introduce some new terms. Firstly, if we refer to something as polar, we generally mean that it has two opposite ends. These could be geographic poles or magnetic poles or philosophical poles, um, or as in this case, electrostatic. A polar bond is a bond that has a slight separation of charge. And by this I mean that there's a small excess of negative electrostatic charge at one end, that's where the greater electron density is, and a small excess of positive electrostatic charge at the other end. These two ends represent the two poles of the polar bond, and we can also refer to them as the bond dipole, which is just a fancy way of saying it has two opposite ends. So let's look at a couple of examples. We'll compare hydrogen fluoride and hydrogen iodide. So let's first look at the electronegativities of the atoms involved. And we can then calculate the difference in electronegativity for each bond. So for hydrogen fluoride, uh, which is made of a hydrogen and a fluorine atom, the difference in electronegativity will be 1.9. And for the hydrogen iodide, it's going to be 0.4. So you can see that both bonds are polar because there's a difference in electronegativity between the two atoms that make them up, but that the HF bond is more polar than the HI bond. If we now look at the molecules as they're rendered in the Molecules 360 database, it gives us a picture that indicates where the electron density is highest. As we saw on the last slide, you can see that for HF there's a strong concentration of electron density around the fluorine, 
and if the electrons are spending more time at that end, it means that that end of the molecule has a partial negative charge. Not a full charge like an ion, resulting from the complete transfer of an electron, but a significant and measurable partial charge nonetheless. Hydrogen iodide, on the other hand, looks green, meaning that the electron density is fairly evenly distributed. You can see there's a slight yellowish hue to the larger iodine atom, and a slight bluish tint to the hydrogen end, indicating that the bond is not completely nonpolar, but this is a very weak polarity. Now, these pretty diagrams are all very well, but we need a quick way of indicating a bond dipole on paper if we don't have rainbow pens. So we do it like this. If I draw out the bond like this, and I've got it in that direction to match the picture, then we draw an arrow along the length of the bond, and the pointy bit of the arrow goes towards the more electronegative end, and then we put a little sort of cross on the other end, like a plus, to indicate the more positive end. So in other words, the arrow is pointing in the direction that the electron density is shifting. We can also use a small delta plus and delta minus to indicate the partial charges. The deltas in particular meant to indicate that we're not talking about ions here. It's not a complete charge. And if we do the same thing for hydrogen iodide, we draw the arrow to indicate the bond dipole, and we draw in our partial charges. So you can see that polar bonds are not all alike. Some are more polar than others. In fact, we can place them on a continuum. At one end are the completely non-polar covalent bonds between two identical atoms. And then as we increase the difference in electronegativity between the two atoms, we form slightly polar bonds, and then very polar bonds. And then if we keep going, we eventually get to the point where instead of just hogging a larger share of the electron density, the more electronegative atom actually co-opts a whole electron from the other atom, and then we're forming ionic bonds. Okay, so far we've just been looking at individual bonds, but where we're heading with this is to look at whole molecules. And so far the only kind of molecule we can deal with are diatomics, which aren't very interesting. So in the next video, we're going to look at how to add bond dipoles in order to find out what the dipole is for an entire molecule.